Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, as I said, my name is Amy Kendall, and I've had the privilege of working in our disability um, area for almost 30 years. So it tells you how old I am. And so, um, just to give you a little of background, and um, not only am I a parent and a professional, so I do a little bit of both. I have a son who's 21 years old who has multiple disabilities. He has sensory processing disorder, ADHD, Tourette's, anxiety disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And I always tell everybody, he's my hero, um, the way he handles his disabilities with dignity and grace. And so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what it means to have that balance. So first I'm gonna ask, how many of you are either a parent of an individual with disabilities or have disabilities yourself? If you're raised, are any of you parents or go through it, so a few of you. And how many of you are also or in the field who are either a volunteer, a staff member? So there's a few also. So I have the, the, the privilege of having both areas. And so first I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what is balance. And so balance is an even distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. And so to have balance, it keeps us upright. If we don't have balance, we tend to lean over, we tend to drop things, we tend to miss out on things. And so a lot of times we're wearing multiple hats. And so we're gonna talk about that, what it is to wear a hat as a parent with a disability, an individual with disability, but also either a leader or a volunteer in a disability area. So the parent hat, I'm gonna to talk to you about from Psalms um, 127.3, it says, See, children are a gift from the Lord. The children born to us are a special reward. And for those of you who are just parents in general, we know our kids are a blessing. And that's why I'm saying that my son is my hero. Because even though he has disabilities, the way he handles life is just, it's given me so many gifts. And so first it talk about what it means to have, find balance as a parent. So it means to allow your child's disability to be their story. My son has given me the opportunity to share his story. And so the first thing you want to do is if you are a parent of a child with a disability, is make sure that they've given you that permission. I don't share anything that my son hasn't okay. I don't share his, um, his insecurities, his obstacles that he has to face, his challenges, unless I, I got permission. So make sure that their story is their story and it's not your story. Second, you want to reach out to others. Don't do life alone. I know how much it means to me when I have other people who understand me. Um, I jokingly say um, I use Facebook, but I only use Facebook for um, my friends who do disability ministry or who have and um, children with disability because they get me. To have people that really understand you is so important as you're doing ministry and also as you're doing life. And so make sure you're reaching out to others. Don't isolate and stay away from it, but really making sure that you're having people that can rally around you. Next is look for support groups. Um, here in California, we're so blessed that there's so many different support groups um, through churches, through um, regional center, through just a multitude of other things. And so make sure you're reaching out and you're connecting with other people who again are walking beside you. And if you can find a respite program, which is a place where um, you can get a break. Respite stand basically means to have a break. And so find a respite program. If your church doesn't have one, look for a church in your local area where you can go and take your child and drop them off and go and take some time. We at the Mariners have a respite program once a month and the giving of our parents the gift of time where they can just go home and go back to sleep or maybe they can go shopping without a child at Target saying, I want that car, I want that Barbie. Um, it's so much, um, so much a blessing for them. And so give them time. So those are the ways to find balance. But what are some of the goals that we have as a parent of a child with a disability? Our number one goal is to give our child independence. We want our child to be able to do things on their own. We want them to be able to hopefully one day maybe live on their own or maybe to live in an independent situation. But so independence is our number one goal we want to attain. Second, we want them to know God. I had a, a pastor a long time ago tell me that 
Um, I did need to share Christ with our families because all individuals with disabilities got to heaven. And I told them I wasn't willing to take that risk. And so I shared Christ with every single one of my kids that come through our ministry. And so then knowing that without a shadow of doubt, they've heard the gospel. Next is we want our kids to have friends. We want them to have somebody who cares about them, not just us, but someone that they can um, link arms with and do life with. And so that's another thing is finding some place where your child is making friends and making peers. Also, we want them to be accepted. Different churches have different ways that we attain um, the disability ministries, but ultimately I wanted my child to be able to come through the door and someone to say, Kaden, you're so excited you're here. And to have someone other than myself care about them. For a lot of our kids, um, sometimes it's those faces of like, oh goodness, a child is coming back to church and there's so much work. But if we can find a place and allow a place where our kids feel accepted and secondly loved, what a great thing to do. And so as a parent, those are some goals that we're going to have for our child. Next is finding balance as a leader. So what are some ways to find balance? One, don't do it alone. For a lot of you, you may be the church and you may be the only staff member or volunteer who's doing disability ministry. And so if that's true, find other churches that are doing what you're doing. Talk to some of the speakers that are here that can connect you with another church. Um, I'm really blessed that I have different people throughout the country that I can reach out to and I can share my trials, my joys, and I can just call them and say, oh my gosh, I'm having such a hard week. And I can share with them and they say, I get it. I understand. And so find other people that are doing the same thing you're doing. Next is find a mentor. Find someone who's been doing it for a long time. Um, I was blessed with um, someone who um, was back in back east. She was in uh, Washington, D.C. And when I met her for the first time when I was brand new in ministry, she said she walked beside me and she would be with me. And so I was able to call her and she was able to encourage me and iron sharpen iron and I got better. And on the flip side, God's been able to do that with me. And so I've been able to meet different people throughout the world and throughout the country where they call me on a regular basis and I can encourage them and, and, and be their biggest cheerleader. And so I, I let you know right now, if you need someone to be your cheerleader and someone to support you, I'm here for you. Others, because you're here, will be there for you. We'd love to support you. And so don't have a problem reaching out to us and we'd love to be that for you. Next, um, don't, you don't need to recreate the wheel. I think sometimes when we think about disability ministry, we think we have to create but, you know, some shiny thing and some beautiful new thing. But sometimes just taking what kids ministry is doing or youth ministry is doing and just doing a few tweaks is so much easier. I think the hardest thing we do is we think like, oh, we're going to have this curriculum for, for our kids in the disability world and then this curriculum for the typical children's. And the reality is most of our families have multiple kids. And so if John was doing one curriculum and then Sally is doing it different, there's no cohesiveness. And so if possible, find a curriculum that you can just do some adaptations. And so that way when our parents are going home, they get to talk about the same curriculum and they're sharing the same thing. And it's not like one sticks out like a sore thumb because they don't get to do the typical curriculum. And so try not to know the importance to recreate the wheel. Another one is set boundaries. I learned really early that I am not a no person. And I don't know how many of you are like that. Maybe you're a people pleaser a little bit like me. And so when someone says, can you do this? And I say, okay, sure. Even though I have a million things on my plate. And so learning to set boundaries. And on that same thing, it's okay to say no. Okay, I want you guys all to practice with me. And I know it's a little slow, but Okay, I'm going to say no, and I want you to repeat it. Ready? No. no. Excellent. So next time when your pastor comes up to you and says, hey, can you throw a party for 300 families? You're going to say no. no. <laughs> if you don't have the time. If you have the bandwidth, yes. But learn to okay to set boundaries and say no. Sometimes the best idea is better than all the ideas. So choose one thing to do. Next is... Saying it, we did that one. And then also remember your armor and have a troop. I'm reminded by um, the story of 
the, 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 um, the armor of God. And so when you read that story in the Bible, if you remember, it talks about the helmet, and it talks about the breastplate, and it talks about the sword, and it talks about the belt. But if you think about it, it never talks about anything on their backs. No armor is on their backs. And in, in those days, the armor was on the front. And the reason before that is when troops came to battle, they went side to side, and they had each other's backs. And so they didn't need to have anything on their backs because they were linked together side by side. And so remember, have an army, have your troops, and wear those armors. And so that way you guys are binded together and you're supporting each other. And so don't go again, don't go alone, but remember to do it with someone else. So your goals as a leader. Our number one goal when I was at Saddleback and also at Mariners is connecting kids to God and others. So when you go in every week into your ministry, you remember you're gonna do both the vertical and horizontal. So you're gonna connect kids to God, up to God, and with others. And so making that your goal, that was our mission statement, is connecting kids to God and others. And so every week you went and said, okay, how am I gonna share the gospel with our children? And how am I gonna allow them to have a friend, a buddy who gets to know them? The other thing is, Give parents time to get filled up. Sometimes you're gonna have a student who is really having a tough day at church, but as best you can, try to keep them with you and not call a parent out. Because sometimes that hour, hour and a half, however long your church service is, is the only time our families are getting a break and gonna hear the gospel and hear about God. And sometimes your church is chosen for the discipline ministry just so they can come and learn about the Lord because you have that. And so I take it very uh, dearly into my hands of knowing that when we get a love on those kids for that period of time, their parents are being filled up with God's love and God's truth and God's grace so they can spend the rest of the week with their child. Also, create a ministry that can be able to be run without you. The greatest thing you can do is raise up volunteers and other staff members who can do what you're doing without you. When I'm put at church and I have a weekend away and it's being run smoothly, that's a success of what God's doing through me versus if I'm gone and everything falls apart, you haven't raised up anybody to help because you're, you're the person who's like, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. But instead, learn to say, hey, could you do this for me? Hey, this week, can you handle this? And so raising people up who can partner with you so you can get away and get a break. Also, one of the goals is we want to see kids grow in their faith. The hardest part about disability ministry sometimes is we may not be the ones who get to see kids say, I'd like to accept Jesus. Or they may not be the ones that get to say, oh, I want to be baptized, I want to be baptized. And it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it's a lot less than a typical kids ministry or youth ministry. But I share this and I share this all the time. We are the luckiest people alive because we get to do disability ministry. More so than our senior pastors, sorry. More so than our youth pastors and our children's pastors because the people that we get engaged with when we get to heaven are going to be completely different. And so think about the student you work with who's nonverbal and doesn't talk to you. When we get to heaven, the conversations we're going to have with them are going to be so amazing. I have a young man whose name is Michael, who is nonverbal, and I've known him for almost 17 years. And sometimes I just look at him and I say, oh, Michael, the talks we're going to have when we get to heaven are going to be so glorious. And also, for those of us who have individuals who are in wheelchairs, to know that we're going to get to heaven and get a dance with them and run with them, what a blessing. And so remember that we get to share our faith in a different way. And so some of our kids, you may think, don't understand you, but know when you get to heaven, you're going to hear how you truly, truly impacted people's lives. And so don't give up. Okay. Next, have leaders that are willing to grow as well. Sometimes people will serve because they just think they're supposed to, or, you know, the Bible calls us to serve it, so they do that. But you want to have leaders that you're also growing in your, their faith as well. And so encourage them in that as well. You are the disability person, 
but it doesn't mean you can't also be a shepherd to those that serve you. Next, we're going to look at the balance between being both a parent and a leader. So again, we talked about setting boundaries. Setting boundaries are really important. Also, find support outside of your church. Sometimes it was hard because I was both a parent and a leader. And so it was hard to have the parents be my support because I was supposed to be their support. And so I would reach outside the church. I would find other churches or other support groups where I could get filled up. Next is don't personalize. We are not going to please all the people all the time. There are many families who have not liked me and have gotten angry because I haven't been able to do certain things for their kids. And I have to remember that it's not about me. And so we serve to the best of our ability and do the best that we can. But when you have someone who gets really angry at you and maybe is upset at how you're running your ministry, know that it's okay. God is still using you as a vessel and you don't have to personalize it. Also, remember which hat you're wearing. Remember when you're there on a, on a Sunday and you're serving and you're working, that's your professional hat. And then remember when you go home at the end of Sunday and you're with your family, leave that professional hat at church. Try not to answer that phone if you can and be that parent. Be that person who you are. So remember the way you're wearing the chat in old times. Also remember, take time off. I think the hardest thing we do in ministry is we go and we go and we go and we go. And I jokingly say this because yesterday I have off on Fridays. I don't have another day off for two weeks because I have a big event going. But after those two weeks, I'm taking four days off. And so making sure that you keep holy the Sabbath. But for a lot of us, we work on the Sabbath. And so making sure that you find a different day. Some of you, it may be Monday. After you've worked on Saturday and Sunday, Monday is your Sabbath. So that means not answering your phone, not looking at your email, not meeting with a family, but truly taking a day off. God honors those who honor the Sabbath. It's clearly in our Ten Commandments we know to keep holding the Sabbath. And so I encourage those of you who are doing ministry 24-7, stop. Stop and take time for yourself and your family and re get rejuvenated so you can serve and be a better servant. Also, and this is a hard one for a lot of people, allow yourself to fail. I have found when I'm the best shepherd is when I've done something wrong and I've learned from it. For a lot of us, we may be type A personalities or have the kind of personality where you want to do everything right. I just recently switched jobs, as you, you saw, and I've just been on staff on Mariners for about two months. And a couple days ago, I had the worst day. I couldn't do anything right. I went to, put, to have a flyer printed off. I printed the wrong size. I tried to resize it. I didn't know how. I printed, finally figured out how to size it. I realized that the back was the wrong thing. So I killed a tree a few times over. And so, but I never know how to print those flyers because I failed and I learned from it. None of us learn from doing everything right. One of our mottos we have in our family is our weakness is our witness. And so for those things that I don't do well, it's my story to tell of how God's allowed me to do better in the, in, the, in the future. And so for those of you who really struggle with failing, this may be difficult, but sometimes failing, trying something new, trying a new tactic in, um, whether it be as a parent or as a professional, try something new. And if you fail, it's okay because you're going to learn and you're going to grow from it. And God uses those things to create a new limb. Just as a starfish, if you were to cut off limbs of the starfish, they grow back. And that's kind of how God uses us. He prunes us. He takes those things that we make mistakes and we fail, and then he grows a new shoot, and it's the strongest shoot sometimes that you've ever had. Next is for goals of a parent. So do on for other kids as you want your own child to, done. 
I never do something for our child in a ministry that I wouldn't want to do for my own child. And I would never do less for a child in my ministry than I want my, my son to have. And so remember, whatever you're doing, do it as if it's your own child. Next, build relationships with other families. I have been so blessed that some of my friends are people who have sons and daughters with disabilities. And just to be able to walk beside them and then walk beside me has been transforming into my life. And so having those relationships where I can lean on them, again, having the armor of God and back to back. Also, have a spiritually thriving ministry. If you find yourself stopping to get into the word and you find yourself being more about just playing with the kids than teaching the gospel to the kids, stop and reevaluate what you're doing. What is, what is your ministry goals? Take some time away. Let your, your boss know, your spouse know, whoever it is. And, hey, I'm going to take a day away, and I'm going to look at what my goals need to be so we have a spiritually thriving ministry. What needs to be done? Reevaluate what's going on. Also, create an atmosphere of inclusion. Now, inclusion is different for everybody. Inclusion ultimately means that individuals with disability have a place at God's table because we all have a place at God's table. And so that's why churches that don't have a disability ministry are missing the boat. Because again, they're not allowing people with disabilities to have a place at God's table. And so remembering that inclusion may mean that you have a self-contained classroom. So it may be a classroom where all the individuals with disabilities come. Or it may be a buddy program. Maybe you have a one-to-one -one buddy program where for every child with a disability, they have a buddy. But I know that Ultimately, we don't want to turn away individuals with disabilities. We don't want to say, oh, I'm so sorry, our doors are too small, maybe you can't get through without a, with a wheelchair. Or, oh, I'm so sorry, they can't go into that classroom because they're not able to do whatever it is. And so creating an atmosphere of inclusion. Also remember to give everyone grace, even you. I am the worst person when it comes to grace. Like I said, when I had that day a couple days ago and I couldn't print anything to save my soul, I was so tough on myself. And luckily I had people that I worked with that said, oh wait, let me tell you my story of how I messed up. And then I realized we all do it. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. And giving ourselves grace, because if we can't give ourselves grace, is basically telling God that he can't give us grace either. And God gives us grace abundantly, and we're so thankful for that. And so remember to give others grace when they fall, and they fall short, but give it to yourselves as well. And then remember to create a ministry where all children thrive. We want to make sure that every child that comes into our midst, that they thrive and grow in Christ. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the minutia of, okay, I'm going to do this, and then this, and then this, and this, and we stop and don't realize that little Johnny has been left behind because we're so focused on getting from point A to point C that we realize Johnny never got past point A. And so looking at each child individually and their strengths and their weaknesses in creating a ministry that allows them to thrive as God created them. I remember so clearly the day my son said to me, Mom, why did God create me like this? And it broke my heart as a parent, thinking, why did God create him like this? But my son has a story to tell that I'll never be able to tell. And God's using it for him to thrive. His story is impacting people's lives. My son plays video games, and so often when he plays video games with his Tourette's, he has like a voice tick that um, sounds like he's going through puberty and he's 21. And so people on video games will like to make fun of him. And he just matter-of-factly says, no, I have Tourette's. And it stops everyone from making fun, and they say, oh. And then he shares about his Tourette's. And so people all over the country that don't even know my son are being educated about threats and what it means to love on people with disabilities. Because he doesn't get angry, he gives them grace and just shares matter-of-factly. And so creating a ministry for you 
is a place where our kids can thrive, and your church goes, those are our kids with disabilities. They're here, and they get to be part of God's table. So where to go next? One of the things I like to do on a regular basis is get some of my key leaders together, and we do a round table. We know that more, more brains creates better ideas. And so I can create all the ministry things that I want to do, but you know, I'm the one person. And so when you can bring people into your midst and sit down and say, hey, Christmas is coming up. What do you think we should do? And I, I preface them and I say, the best idea wins. So don't personalize your ideas. It's okay if Sally comes in and says, oh, I want to do this. And you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, Sally, we can't do that. But that's a great idea. But I let them know that right off the bat. But sit down, make time with your uh, leaders, and create a roundtable where you can come up with ideas. Some of the best things I've done in ministry were not my ideas, but they were my volunteers, because they were in the thick of it more than I was. Next is talk to other families and leaders. Like I said, if I'm on Facebook. I know Facebook is kind of full now for a lot of people. I, I, I'm not on Snapchat, but I'm on Facebook. And I have people across the country. Um, Doc is one of the test whose Doc is here. Doc and I have been friends on Facebook, and so I know Doc's there. I know if I need something, I can reach out to Doc. I have people all throughout the country. And so some of them I call on a regular basis and, hey, what are you doing in your ministry? Or, you know, have you ever had this happen? And I get ideas from them. So, again, reaching out to other people. Also, remember where your child fits in your life. When you're a mom or you're a dad, you're a mom and a dad. I'm not my son's professional all the time. I'm not his ministry leader. But when I'm at church, I'm his ministry leader and I'm not his mom. And so when my son likes to try to get away and tell people, well, my mom's on the staff, and I say, uh-uh, we're not using the staff card. He has to do what everyone else is doing just because he's on staff. He doesn't get to pull that. And so remember where your child fits in that. And lastly, pray. Pray a lot. Don't cease praying, as it says. When things get tough, it's easy to want to go into work mode and to fix it. Stop. If you need to get down on your knees and pray and ask for God's wisdom, your ministry will thrive. So let me pray for you guys as we finish up. Lord, I thank you for those that are here. And um, Lord, just that they're here means that they have a heart for what the world may call the unlovely, but to us, they are the best individuals around. So I just pray that you bless them as they go about their day and go about their ministry and go about their lives. Bless them in all areas, both physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and even financially, Lord, for them having a heart to serve your lovelies. We pray these things in your name. Amen.